The six ways to play silver as Matt sees it for individual stock pickers. Sir, the stage is yours. Excellent. Well, and in terms of selecting individual equities, um, I would argue that, yes, silver stocks kind of fall into five different baskets. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. Welcome back on into the show. Excited to be back with you on this re recording on a Tuesday morning here. I'm with my good friend, Matt Geiger of MJG Capital. He's the managing partner. One of the smartest people I've met in my uh, adventures in the precious metals and mining space. Uh, I guess started a bunch of years ago. Has been more active the last couple of years. And Matt, it's been a pleasure to meet you and get to know you. And excited to talk some silver and silver stocks today. So welcome on in. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, Chris. It's very generous of you, and I'm I'm glad to be on the program here for the for the first time. Been been following your work for for some time, and of course we've been we've been trading uh, ideas now for for a few years. So it's great to be great to be joining you this morning. On, on what has been a, a bit of a, of a tough week <laughs> for uh, yeah. precious metals and, and, the, and the associated equities, no doubt. Yeah, well, we will dig into all of that. And Matt, I think you're perhaps, I like to giggle and make jokes about my Wharton MBA experience where I learned Keynesian economics and was trained to go out. I know you had, uh, you were actually an undergrad at Wharton and perhaps, uh, I mean, I'll just preface this with what you have done and your career path is quite impressive. So maybe you were, te if you were teaching the classes, I would go back perhaps and get, you know, maybe another finance degree. But maybe to start off, you could let people know uh, a little bit about your background. If uh, Trump was studying you when him and his daughter were at Wharton and anything else, and then we'll dig into the markets from there. Yeah, I'd be happy to, Chris. So I, I grew up in uh, Silicon Valley, what, what some would consider the mining capital of the world. <laughs> As I say that in, in full jest. Uh, funny enough, San Francisco in, in the late 1800s was actually, you know, uh, the mining capital of the world. I think many would agree with that. But obviously nowadays it, it couldn't be farther from the case. Um, it's viewed kind of out here as a dirty, stodgy, old-fashioned uh, industry, which, which, which is a shame because I don't, I don't think the VCs and, and tech investors um, that are that are putting money into into the newest Teslas and Ubers and what have you understand the importance of the materials that are actually going in, into the applications. Um, I did go to the uh, Wharton uh, undergrad program at, at UPenn in Philadelphia. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, thought that went into that, to be honest. Uh, it was a big change. I grew up in in the suburbs, so kind of 40 minutes south of San Francisco to kind of get thrown right into the the midst of a big city. I just applied there because it was the number one undergraduate business uh, program, and that, that was good enough for me. Um, when I went to the school, I, I envisioned myself, you know, four or five years from, from there living in, in New York, you know, driving around a, a black bands and wearing a, a tie all day. But <laughs> within a few months, I, I was quickly uh, yeah, disillusioned of kind of the, the typical corporate uh, Wall Street or, or consulting um, route that uh, Morton seemed to, to kind of feed. It's, it's students. And I think that's a perfectly fine route for certain types of personalities and certain types of, of people. Um, I myself have I've learned over the years I'm quite entrepreneurial for better or for worse. And so kind of when I made that decision, I wasn't gonna go to the big banks or to the big consultants, big three consultants. I kind of, I wanted to do something myself and build from the, the ground floor. I actually launched the MJG fund as a 19 year old uh, in my dorm room as, as a sophomore. And so that's how I, I, I really got my my start as a, as a money manager I started with eight, eight investors at that time, um, mainly friends and family, to be honest, taking a, sh a shot on me. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I made sure to structure the partnership with a 10 year lockup, which is very extreme. Um, but I was encouraged by, by people out there like Rick rule, for instance, whose expiration capital funds have always had that, uh, 10 year lockup, which of course is going to make it tougher to raise money. But by the same token, it allows you the proper structure to invest with a long-term focus and not get blown out at the bottom of, of the markets. Um, and as it, as it turns out, the first few years, to be honest, after launching were extremely uh, painful. And you, prob you, you were probably investing in the space as well. I know you were. You're 2012, 13, 14, 15. Talk about four years of, of pain and getting kicked in the teeth, getting kicked in the groin, and then getting kicked in the teeth again. So. Yes. 
the good news is because of the structure, we, we survived um, what was a very painful and, and drawn out bear market. Um, you know, we've more than quadrupled the amount of investors um, in, in the fund over the course of, of um, the, the nine years that we've been in existence. And over the uh, past five years in particular, we've uh, blown the S&P um, and the TSXV um, out, out of the water. So um, th things, have, things have been going well. And um, it's been a very strong market. Just looking at the short term, even over the past 90 days, it's, it's been, there's been a lot of buy-in activity, a lot, a lot of green in the portfolio. Um, so it's been exciting times, no doubt. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's pretty awesome to hear. Uh, maybe the only way it could be better is if you said you actually skipped Wharton classes so you could have more time to yourself to create your business. Um, because I think that's... <laughs> there was definitely some of that, Chris. Yes, I was, I was yes, we have a. really... Par parents watching at home, <clears throat> I don't have children, but I think my dog would think you're cool. And Matt is really a role model. He's gone to one of these big name schools. And again, it was your own entrepreneurial ability and maybe just having the support and belief of people who cared in you to say, go do what you feel is right. And, um, and especially going through those challenging times where, yeah, it's like you said, it was a tough couple of years. And I don't know if you want like that return next quarter. Silver isn't the place to do that. but um i think it's exciting then you have that base of knowledge when everything is set up for i don't know i mean maybe maybe you can pro see if there's a counter argument i mean with what the fed is doing right now it seems like on some level we're set up for the bull market of a of a generation in the metals um what do you see happening there well you know just just to be clear um and i, I do have some thoughts but I, but I want to emphasize that as an investor, I'm, I'm very much a bottom-up investor. So my, my focus is not on making broad uh, market prognostications. Um, I think it's important to have a view and have a thought of where we are in the cycle. But for me, the majority of my time or the vast majority is spent uh, analyzing individual uh, securities um, from a bottom-up basis. And that includes looking at the, the management team really first and foremost. Um, do they have the proper experience in the venture they're trying to carry out? Have they made money for, for shareholders in the past? You know, do they operate, them, uh, operate ethically and honestly? Uh, do they have access to capital uh, to continue financing activities if times get tough? Those are all questions I ask. You know, then I look at the actual asset, but I plug in spot metal prices or even lower than that. So you know, even if I do think that silver is going to 50 or, or above, um, out of the sake of out of sake of conservatism, I would never use higher than spot price. And given the run in the silver price that we we've, we've seen, honestly, over the over the past six months or so, I wouldn't really feel comfortable using anything over twenty dollars uh, per per ounce. To be honest, um, you know, then you look at the company's financial structure, um, upcoming catalysts, uh, whether it offers value um, at its current price, the jurisdiction it's based in, and then only then do I really take a, a deep dive into any particular. Uh, the, the, the target commodity of that company. So for me, it's the process just kind of flip, flipped on its, on its head. Um, you know, that said, uh, we do have a pretty heavy weighting towards precious metals in the MJG portfolio at the moment. Um, we're roughly 75, uh, getting closer to 80% weighted yeah. towards it's gold and silver equities. Just go all in sometimes. I'll, although it's great, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll behave myself because I, and that's what I appreciate. And I apologize for interrupting, but I appreciate that okay. you can share today, you know, the, the, the alternate approach where you you have some balance to that. So uh, this is good to hear. And please Ab hear. Absolutely right. But I, I should emphasize that's a combination of absolutely some, you know, uh, well, I'd say it's a combination of two things. First is just the outperformance of the gold and silver names relative to, you know, copper juniors, nickel juniors, uranium juniors really since May of, of 2019, where we saw gold break that key 1375 technical level. And some would argue that the, the precious metals bull market really started. Others would say it began in 2016, but that's, that's kind of neither here nor there for this discussion. Definitely over the past 18 months or so, the gold and silver equities have, have absolutely led their, their brethren focused on uh, base and uh, energy metal um, as, as the target commodities. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason. The second is, I, I will say, like, if you look at the entire uh, universe of, of juniors to select from, uh, particularly in, in uh, Canada on TSXV, 
you know, a good 40, 45% of, uh, of the names that are out there are, are precious metal focused as is, um, which, which some would actually say is a bit of a, a misallocation of resources potentially. Um, last time I checked kind of, of all the metal pulled out of the ground on an annual basis across the spectrum, roughly 20% of the value is, is, is due to gold and, and silver. Um, so maybe the fact that 45, close to 50% of juniors are focused on these two metals um, is, is a bit of a misallocation. So I, I think people should, should keep that in mind. But that said, there are some phenomenal management teams focusing on, on precious metal assets. And because that's really the first, the first place I start, um, that's, that's kind of why we've, we've, we've been drawn in this, in this direction. But to be honest, 80% is feeling, 75% uh, is feeling a bit un uncomfortable, to be honest. So I think for the foreseeable future here, um, until we see another March-like uh, drawdown, um, you know, painful as it was, or until we see significant uh, additional inflows into the fund, um, I'm most likely just going to stick with our existing horses, at least for, for gold and silver equities, and, and kind of hold off on initiating any new positions, um, which is just more of a portfolio construction uh, decision, given where we are in the market and how we're exposed. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And Matt, you gave me a couple of bullets here, which was kind of you. And I, I don't know if I can wait any longer to ask this one. The six ways to play silver as Matt sees it for individual stock pickers. Sir, the stage is yours. Excellent. Well, I just kind of wanted to, to take a top-down approach and kind of look at the silver landscape as is. Um, obviously, probably the two most um, you know, obvious ways, we're, we're not even on that, that list I, I sent over to you quickly, Many investors will just buy physical, and you know that that could be you know through buying physical coins or or, or, or bullion, um, could be through you know buying um, you know a paper a paper a physical paper ETF for silver, um, or it could be buying you know a, a ETF that's backed by physical silver. I think Sprott's tickers PSLV. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's 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 one that's one to, to look at. Um, but then in terms of selecting individual equities. Um, I would argue that, yes, silver stocks kind of fall into five different baskets. Uh, the first would be the production stage name. So the names with, uh, with one or more uh, producing mines. And, you know, obvious names that come to mind would be Pan American and um, First Majestic, uh, Endeavor, uh, Fortuna Silver, uh, Maya, Maya Silver, which is an interesting one and kind of one that's gaining higher profile. Um, we actually own none of the production stage names, funny enough. Um, in terms of, of the MJG and, and kind of my investment style, if we own cash flow names and we do in the portfolio, it's almost entirely through the royalty uh, business model. Um, and so we, we at the moment, wild, wildly enough, only have one um, producing miner in the portfolio. The rest is either royalty, prospect generation, uh, post-discovery, or a company in, in the development stage. Um, so we kind of steer, steer clear of producing miners, uh, just, just out of, out of reverence for the, the, um, royalty business model, which has done very well for investors over the past 15 years. Um, kind of the second category of, of silver equities, I would consider these the, the high quality development projects and, and they can be of, of varying stages. Uh, names that come to yeah. mind in, in this category would be Adriatic metals, um, silver crest, um, you know, Go Gold potentially with their Los Ricos discovery down in Mexico, um, Alexco up in the Yukon, Mag Silver. You know, these are mines that really, regardless of whether silver stays at 28, 27, 28, goes up to 50 or falls back into the high teens, these are mines that are going to be built um, in, in, the, in the pretty near future here. And so I think you're not taking particular risk with the actual metal price with these names. Um, then there's the third category, which I would consider the optionality plays. And these are generally characterized as very large tonnage projects, lower grade, and sometimes a pretty high initial capex um, and, and high capital intensity in, in terms of the investment. And the names here include, you know, Discovery Metals is really the first that comes to mind. Bear Creek Mining is another one. Uh, maybe you could throw Kootenay Silver with its Promontorio and Lanegra projects, uh, large, low grade into the mix. Um, Southern Silver as well with, with what they're doing at Cerro Las Minitas. Um, if you want to aggressively, you know, bet on 50 or $50 plus silver, these are probably yeah. the names that will supply the most leverage just due to their size. <laughs> you, seem, you seem to agree with that. 
I, I got to go yeah, call I mean, my he, broker. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's, that's just the way it generally works when you're plugging in $35, $40, $45, $50 silver into, into models. On paper, these assets are, are going to look phenomenal. That said, I'm still not convinced that any of them will be built this cycle. That doesn't mean that fortunes can't be made in the meantime for those that are very bullish on silver. As I mentioned, this is not my general style of investing. Um, I prefer the high quality development plays, ones that are more likely to be taken out you know, by, by a larger party and then actually brought, put into production. I think it's a lower risk way and you still get plenty of, of added upside um, if silver outperforms expectations and keeps rising. Um, but for, for those that really wanna gamble and want maximum leverage, these, these large optionality plays are, are probably the way to go. Funny enough, we actually own a couple of them, um, including Discovery uh, Metals and Kootenay Silver. But that is, those are from placements that we participated in. I think the Discovery Metals one was back in 2017, and then Kootenay's was in early 2019. We got very attractive deals. Management was putting in money alongside us, full warrant in each case. So I will occasionally um, dabble, I could say, in the optionality uh, names, but they, they have to be very much out of favor, very good deal, deal terms, and I have to be confident that I'm getting in at the same um, level as management. So these aren't names that I would add to in the current state of the market. Other investors that want to be more aggressive, that's the, that's the decision to be had. And then quickly here, the final two categories would then be kind of the post-discovery silver names, and those that are in the early stages of expiration but have already hit what at least some uh, parts of the market would consider a discovery hole. So that could be Vizsla, which has obviously been a very well talked about name over the, of the past few months. Um, BlackRock Gold um, also has, has hit some very high grade silver and, and kind of uh, a few drill holes at this point. So these are names that have run up significantly where it looks like there may be an economic discovery that, that has been made. Uh, we'll, we'll just have to see how that plays out. And then finally, there's kind of the expiration pre-discovery names which are the, the riskiest uh, way to play, to play silver. Um, and you know, I, I generally don't play pre-discovery. I, I like post-discovery. I'm okay paying a bit higher of evaluation where I get a sense, hey, there actually might be something real here versus you know, let's drill and see if there's even a chance that there's something real here. It's like a whole different added level of risk. That says, we said, we do own one company in kind of the pre, pre-discovery stage. Um, this is just not a recommendation. This is just sharing kind of how we're, we're positioned. But that company's uh, Boreal Metals, and we participated in the five and a half cent uh, placement um, from just a couple uh, months ago. Um, they have their Gumsberg project in, in Sweden that actually is uh, staked around um, what was the most prolific uh, silver mine in, uh, in European history. It hasn't had sig seen significant uh, production within the past uh, century, but there's been a ton of silver pulled out of the ground there. And they have an excellent uh, technical team, um, Eric Jensen from, from EMX, who's one of Dave Cole's top lieutenants there, Eric. putting a lot of time into the Boreal story, um, you know, cheap valuation. And they also have a second project that's optioned off to, to Belieden. That one's more of copper gold, I, ISCG opportunity. But I think Boreal is one that's kind of been missed potentially as there's been a mad rush from at least some segments of, of the investor community to, to pile into silver stocks over the past few months. So anyway, those, those are the, uh, the categories as I see them, the producers, high quality development names, large optionality plays, uh, post-discovery expiration plays, and then pre-discovery expiration plays. You know, I will add, there, there aren't, to my knowledge, any you know, true silver-focused prospect generators or true silver-focused royalty companies which would be, in theory, two other ways to play it. But with, with this middle metal, uh, metal in particular, I, I don't know of names that fall into that pure play category. <laughs> well, that was pretty awesome. Uh, thank you for breaking that down so clearly. Uh, again, to second what you said, this is not, Matt's not, he doesn't know everyone who's watching. So this isn't specific licensed financial advice yet. That I'll be rewinding and listening to that a couple of times because it's nice to have really the different profiles laid out clearly because everybody wants different things. They have different portfolios, different risks you're balancing. And, you know, I, I think that's a great guide to get people started. So thank you for that, Matt. Uh, sure. I know you have a and couple add, minutes. At one point to that, Chris, I mean, you have to know yourself as an investor, right? Like these are all very legitimate ways to, to play silver if you want to play that or to just speculate on a high quality management team. 
and a good asset that happens to be focused on silver. So you kind of have to know where you, you fall in the mix as an investor and kind of where your temperament is and where you anticipate these investors kind of fitting into your portfolio. So to each his own. I certainly agree. Uh, last one before we wrap up, we'll combine maybe two bullets into one. Do you see a strengthening US dollar posing a threat to silver bulls? And it looks like you feel gold and silver are gonna consolidate over the next six to nine months. Uh, so anything you could share there? Sure, so yeah, I, I guess on the US dollar front, uh, absolutely. I, I think that's, that's something that any commodity investor should be, should be following, the, the DXY or, or Dixie as it's commonly referred to. Um, just, to just to get a sense, I mean, commodities worldwide at the moment are priced in US dollars and all things equal a stronger US dollar is gonna, is gonna crimp the price of commodities while a weakening one is gonna act as a tailwind for the price. It's, it's as simple as that. And so, you know, when you're, <clears throat> you know, the, the Dixie, especially during the March um, drawdown, uh, strengthened to, to north of, of $100. And that was a pretty, a pretty frightening, frightening period. Um, the Fed acted pretty quickly. Um, you know, swap lines <clears throat> was one of the tools in the toolbox they pulled out to really tamp down on the US dollar. And, and try to avoid uh, a rush into that uh, into the currency, which could cause problems for the global financial system uh, as is. You know, so far they've they've been successful. Um, I'm not uh, all too big into technical analysis. I know you have a lot of guests that come onto the show that are, so you could probably get a, a better perspective from them. But you know, just a couple months ago, I was talking to one of the the more visible U.S. dollar bulls. Um, I think it's very important to, to, to keep in touch with those that kind of are sitting on the other side of the, the table and may have a complete opposite view on the market, just to see what they're thinking. His sense was that the, if the Dixie broke below $94, it, uh, it, would, it would almost certainly fall to, to 88, was kind of the obvious technical uh, support that, that he mentioned to me. We, we've seen the Dixie break below 94, um, but it's kind of bottomed out in the 91, 92 range. And we haven't seen that, that final drawdown to 88. So I don't want to speculate and say we have to fall to that level. Um, technical analysis is a game of probabilities. Um, but I, I would say there's been a little strengthening, as, as you can see in the chart on the Dixie. This could be the start of a big move. I personally don't, don't, uh, don't think it is. Um, I think we'll, we will most likely see, see 88. Um, and, and that could provide a, couple, a few months more of, of tailwinds um, for, for precious metals. Um, that said, I'm, I'm not predicting consolidation. I didn't, I didn't want it to come across as that. I was just saying as an investor and particularly as a bottom up um, stock picker, if anything, I would prefer six to nine months of consolidation here. Like the silver price in particular has really moved, Chris. And you, you know this, like we were stuck for seven or eight years in a tight, you know, $7 trading range between, you know, 12 and 19 odd dollars, right? just pinballing back and forth, back and forth from the upper to lower bounds of that range. Now here we are and we've, we've you know, I, I guess there's been the pull up, pull back from yesterday, but silver's been kind of hanging in there mostly in the $26, $27 range, which is, you know, a, a full, you know, 11 or $12 above where it, where it, um, where the average was over the past seven or eight years. So I don't, you know, if it keeps moving, then great. We're, we're plenty exposed and it's going to result, uh, you know, in gains for the portfolio in the short term. But by the same token, you know, I, I, I would prefer as a, as a commodities investor and as a precious metals investor for this, for this bull market to be more sustained and long lasting, right? And I think if you just have a, a sharp spike, um, you know, the, then the hang, it, can, it can end quickly and then the hangover afterwards can, can be pretty painful. So, you know, if we, if we kind of held in this range and just bounced around for six, six to nine months, I think that would speak well to the duration of the current precious metals bull market we're, we're, we're in. And then I also think that from a stock picker's perspective, the better names, kind of the, the cream will, will rise to the top, you could say. And the better names can differentiate themselves from some of the other silver players out there that have gotten a bid purely because they have a, a silver asset and you know, silver in their name. So you know, we'll, we'll see, the market doesn't care about my preferences that much is, is for sure. But um, that's something that as an investor wouldn't bother me at all. We're, we're willing to be patient here, that's for sure. Yeah, I think that goes a long way because uh, I don't have the first clue what's going to happen the next month or couple of months. Although I can say that during the election coming up, somebody is going to be printing a lot. Here was Trump today. Basically, he was rebuffed when he tried to get the, uh, the dollar devalued against the yuan. Um, so 
Yeah, I think what you mentioned there and also having a long-term perspective sure helps. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of nice too, rather than sitting there being like a stock junkie glued to a screen each day. You know, I think it's a great time for people to take a step back, go out for a walk. I'm, I'm learning, I'm not telling anyone else to do. That's what I've been enjoying <laughs> myself. And I'm grateful that there are people that know this sector so eloquently and beautifully as you do. And perhaps just before we wrap up, uh, you can let folks know. I don't know if you do if you take new investors or how they can find out more information about what you're doing and just just stay posted. Yeah, well, to, well, to that point, quickly, um, you know, Buffett is, is on the record saying that investors would do much better and see much better performance if they're only allowed to to check their stock tickers, say, once a week or even once a yeah. month. And I'd actually say as the world gets more and more, uh, you know, fast paced and short term oriented the more and more valid that is. So absolutely, take, take walks, listen, listen to Chris's advice. I, I agree with that fully. Um, you know, try to create some sense of separation between you and your portfolio. I think it, it will serve most everybody listening to this, to the show well. Um, in terms of contacting me, you know, I, I love, I love uh, talking about uh, the fund, about talking about new investment opportunities, talking about the space in general. Um, investors can, can find my contact info on, on the fund's website. That's www.mjgcapital.com, mjgcapital.com. Um, there's a contact form there where, where investors can get in touch with me. And yes, we are, we are taking new investors into the fund. It's, a, it's an open-ended fund. But even if you're just interested in talking about a holding or two that we have or some general thoughts on the market or, or how to dip your, your toes into the junior resource sphere, um, I'm here for you. So yeah, please, please reach out. And uh, I look forward to, to being in touch with, with a few of your, uh, your audience. Well, I sure appreciate that, Matt. Um, I mean, it was pretty impressive what you laid out there today. Also interesting, you started in September of 2011, the absolute peak of the cycle, which I would say, A, just a testament to your, to your fortitude and getting through the bear market. I think there's a ton that we learn from when things don't go according to plan. Um, you know, but also uh, impressive that you've been able to keep things going during that time and you can stay in the game for when, uh, whether it's this year, next six months, next two years, um, yeah. seems like the Fed's never going to slow down. And um, folks, the info to take a look at Matt's website is in the description field below. So Matt, I know you got a meeting come up. We'll let you run, but thank you so much for joining me. And yeah, we'll have to do this again soon. It's been fun, Chris. We'll, we'll do this again soon. Thanks for having me on.